Good evening. I am Dr. Sridhar Kalyanasandram, consultant neonatologist. Welcome to my channel. I hope uh, you have reviewed the various playlists and uh, as I said earlier, there are playlists for the parents and there are playlists for the medical personnel. I am starting a new series on mechanical ventilation, which is a very important topic for everyone working in the intensive care, especially this is focused at the neonatal intensive care. So in this series, I propose to do a series of uh, brief talks, which will include uh, different aspects of uh, mechanical ventilation. Of course, there are many important lectures by Stalwarts in the same channel, and I'll be putting these together as a playlist as well. So the series will include an overview of the mechanical ventilator as such. And in the next video, we'll be looking at mechanical ventilation parameters. Uh, in the third video, we'll look at modes of ventilation and how we choose the right mode. A brief uh, introduction to non-invasive ventilation in the fourth video. And finally, we'll have uh, how to choose the right mode and the approach to ventilation. And if possible, we'll do a video on additional parameters like humidification, suction, complications like air leak and so on. So when we talk of ventilation, we have non-invasive and invasive ventilation and we'll be discussing the different modes uh, separately as we go on. Non-invasive ventilation is nothing but a mode of ventilation where we avoid endotracheal intubation. That means we're using nasal or oropharyngeal interface. We have nasal CPAP and uh, high flow nasal cannula as the most commonly used modes. We have biphasic CPAP, we have non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and finally we have the recent advance in uh, neurally adjusted ventilatory assist or NAVA with non-invasive ventilation. And uh, invasive ventilation uh, on the other hand is ventilatory support using an endotracheal tube and uh, positive pressure ventilation is the main modality. We have conventional mechanical ventilation including the synchronized modes and mostly it's pressure control in newborns but we have volume control as well as an option and we have high frequency ventilation which is a different entity used mostly as a rescue modality. So why do we need ventilation? So we need the ventilation in type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure and the reason is to maintain oxygenation and maintain effective ventilation in the form of the carbon dioxide levels in the blood. We have to minimize the work of breathing and help to optimize the outcome. And we also have to uh, ventilate, avoiding the short and long term complications. So the complications of ventilation may include ventilation induced lung injury, which can be barotrauma, volute trauma, artillery trauma. We have to avoid hypocapnia from overventilation as uh, this can have adverse neurologic outcome in the newborn babies, especially the premature babies. And we have to avoid infections like ventilator associated pneumonia. And uh, of course, chronic lung disease of prematurity is one of the long term complications of mechanical ventilation as well. So as I mentioned earlier, we may ventilate in type 1 respiratory failure to maintain adequate oxygenation and in type 2 where the effort is poor, uh, we have to ventilate to maintain the gas exchange including carbon dioxide washout and to optimize the outcome it's in conditions like necrotizing enterocolitis, septicemia, shock and so on where ventilation is to reduce the work of breathing and to support the oxygenation better in a critically unwell patient while the body recovers. So just a quick overview of how ventilators came into design. So in the late 1800s, we had the negative pressure ventilation and uh, here it was nothing but the chamber uh, enclosed the neck of the patient and the whole body and the negative pressure was generated by different mechanisms like a pump or a bellow and this made the chest move back and forth. So instead of positive pressure, this is a negative pressure where the chest wall is drawn back and forth to do the breathing. This obviously works more for type 2 respiratory failure or neuromuscular problems and this is an interesting uh, image from California in the early 1900s when there was an outbreak of acute poliomyelitis. So it's amazing how far we have come to eradicating poliomyelitis to have modern ventilators which can help with severe lung disease. So here there are many patients on negative pressure ventilation to keep them alive and uh, it was also used in Gilnade Barr syndrome which was not uncommon in those days. And now we have the modern sophisticated machines. Uh, these are just examples, I am not projecting any brands. And uh, 
the ventilators basically have uh, the same design as they were in the 1950s when this design was made and we have the fresh gas supply with the blender the oxygen and air and uh, the gas blend source with blender is needed to deliver the appropriate FiO2 the pressure is also needed as a compressor or a wall source is used to provide the compressed air the humidifier is needed to obviously humidify the gases before it reaches the patient we need the valves which regulate the pressure at delivery which is a peak inspiratory pressure as well as at the expiratory limb or the peep and we need the sensors to monitor the pressure both at the proximal end the distal end and if you have flow sensors at the patient end and these flow sensors are used to uh, help with synchronization as well in the modern ventilators as sophistication advances we have different levels of sophistication of the microprocessor circuits very quick averaging times and uh, the alarm settings which are important for proper functioning to detect uh, deterioration in the patient condition as well as in ventilator malfunction and we mentioned synchronization so uh, the gas supply comes in and the valves are there the ventilation positive pressure ventilation happens depending on the trigger in synchronization goes to the patient and humidification happens before it goes to the patient and uh, it comes back and the peep valve make sure there is resistance to the expiration that causes the positive and expiratory pressure there are all obviously safety mechanisms like alarm limits and safety valves as well and uh, this is just a simplistic way of representing how the mechanical ventilator circuit works we have great advances in humidification as well which we will hopefully discuss in the future videos we have circuits which uh, help to avoid water logging uh, as the humidity increases in the inspired air water logging is a problem and we have tubings which absorb water or evaporate and we have uh, heater wire circuits as well now we have discussed an overview of what ventilation is uh, we need to think about whether it's really a science or an art or a combination of both and obviously the answer is that it's a combination of both the science behind the ventilator the circuit the machine how it works the, uh, the computer uh, uh, microprocessor parts of it what we can do to improve now we are having uh, continuous oxygen monitoring and feedback based adjustment of the FiO2 as well in most of the ventilators we have more uh, technical advances the same ventilator can deliver most of the modes of ventilation starting from high flow nasal cannula NIPPV CPAP invasive ventilation NAVA and even high frequency ventilation so sophistication has advanced a lot the flow sensor are becoming more clever the processor time has reduced so the science is a clear understanding how it works an understanding of the pathophysiology what options you have appropriate use of surfactant for example at the right time the art is the experience so the decision making is based on the pathophysiology and we should aim to support at the minimum level possible which is safe for the patient's condition so don't over treat most of the time understanding the physiology and supporting to maintain what is needed for the patient so don't aim for numbers specifically look for the physiologic stability of the patient same applies to any condition the carbon dioxide level the blood pressure the ph don't drive for numbers you have to understand the condition for example in a congenital diaphragmatic hernia don't flog the lungs accept a lower level of pao2 provided the child is not acidotic this applies to most situations the same applies to use of inotropes for example where we have permissive hypotension we have the concept of permissive hypercapnia depending on the situation of the baby the age of the patient and so on so all this is the art behind it and when we train junior staff we need to encourage minimizing intervention so uh, use non-invasive ventilation as far as you can appropriate timing of surfactant by the minimal invasive option and use the ventilatory support as minimally as possible don't overdo sedation or paralysis as well because they'll have a negative impact in many uh, cases so we cannot predict the uh, steps that we do and the multiple effects that it will have so do as less as you can to minimally uh, manage so uh, in the next video we will discuss the settings used on the ventilator as well as the impact of the changes so as i discussed before uh, these are a useful series of videos so do subscribe keep your notifications on so you'll know when the next video in the series is released and I request you to share with your colleagues as well. Thank you.